From the Fox News Podcast Network, I'm Dana Perino, and everything will be okay. Hello, and welcome back to another episode of Everything Will Be Okay. This week, I'm joined by four-time Emmy Award-winning journalist and co-host of Good Day New York. Yes, it is Rosanna Scotto. She is an exceptional journalist. She's a business owner. She's a mom. She's a wife. And for many New Yorkers, one of the first faces they wake up to in the morning. With a journalism career spanning over 30 years, Rosanna's inquisitive, vibrant, and poised reporting has made her a legend in morning television. Let's get to know her better here. Rosanna, welcome. Thank you for being here. Dana, thank you so much for having me. I I love your show. I love you on Fox News. You do such great work. And I love following you on Instagram. I love you, doggy. That means you love Percy. I love you, doggy. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a doggy owner as well. What I have kind? a Lulu. She's a cockapoo. Okay. And she's 14 years old. Wow. Yes. That's a good age. I know. You've done a great job. Well, you know, we thought it looked a little shaky this year, but yeah, everything's she, okay. she got through it. Oh my gosh. Well, yeah. it's great to have you. Thank you. Thank you for being here. Let's start off by telling people a little bit about who you are and how you came to be Rosanna Scotto. Um, but you were born Rosanna Scotto. And I would love to hear a little bit about your childhood. What was it like growing up? So I here? grew up in Brooklyn, mm-hmm. uh, Bay Ridge, Diker Heights uh, area. And I went that's to, a great area. It's I got to great, go there for the Christmas lights. We literally lived a block away from, you know, the great lights on mm-hmm. 84th Street between 11th and 12th. Um, when I grew up there, that neighborhood did not have those kind of lights. I mean, everybody had very modest holiday lights. Now it's like whose lights are better than the others. But growing up, I have to say in that neighborhood was, it was a very safe neighborhood. I went to Catholic school, Visitation Academy in Brooklyn and Bay Ridge. Uh, Beautiful all girls school. Um, Cloistered nuns. So for example, my parents never saw my teachers because uh, they were cloistered. They wore a full habit. And when they would come in for parent-teacher conferences, they were behind a black veil. What? Yes. Very strict Catholic upbringing. Wow. I mean, we would sit there with our hands folded at the edge of the desk for an hour if we did something wrong. And not to say that I was scared of the nuns because I love them Mm -hmm. and sometimes like to create a little trouble because, you know. You're a kid and you want to have fun. You're a kid. Push the the boundaries a little bit. So we're about to, you know, receive confirmation and I get my class to say we want to be Jewish. So, um, (laughs) so naturally the parents are called up to school. I said it was a joke. It didn't go over so well. I don't know how many Hail Marys and Our Fathers I had to do to, uh, you know, prove that um, I'm a good Catholic Mm -hmm. and uh, we should go forward and not get thrown out of school. What'd your parents say? My parents always took the teacher's side. Mm. You know, it's funny these days, you know, parents don't always have the teacher's back. Oh, isn't that the truth? I know. And then it was unequivocally, you're wrong, they're right, and you will be punished. Interesting. Yes. And so uh, that was my beginning. And I have to say, going to Catholic school and growing up in a household where I respected my parents, uh, when they said something, I was nervous and I listened to what they had to say. It was, it's the foundation of who I am. Um, and, uh, I then went to uh, private high school, Packard Collegiate Institute in Brooklyn, and then went back to Catholic university for college where I majored in theater because I thought I wanted to be an actress. Uh, but at the time, not many people looked and sounded like I did, uh, in the music world, in the theater world, in the TV world, it was all like you know, Americana. Mm -hmm. You had to look Americana, blonde hair, blue eyes. And the accent from The accent was definitely, yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, So halfway through when I realized I wasn't getting the parts that I wanted, I was like, I I, I need a plan B here. Mm. And growing up in Brooklyn, I always watched uh, Eyewitness News and there was a woman on um, the Eyewitness News team, Roseanne Scamadella. And she looked like me. She sounded like me. We had similar names. Uh, She was from Brooklyn. My parents knew her. 
And uh, they called her up and said, would you sit down and talk with my daughter about how to, you know, get her foot in the door? That's so interesting because in the mentoring world, there's a saying that I, I like to repeat that it goes like this. You have to see her to be her. And it's one of the reasons I I do support Take Your Children to Work Day, because I don't think this is just true for girls. Um, But it it does, especially when you were just starting out, it's like, wait, she can, she did it. And your parents were like, maybe you could do that. Right. And then you end up going to Atlanta. Is that right? I did. I started in Atlanta at the time. um, Ted Turner was just starting CNN. And he also had the superstation WTBS. And I, I, I took anything. Get my foot in the door, non-union shop. Um, We used to call it the Turner School of Broadcasting because he hired everybody out of school. We were all making mistakes together. (laughs) And it was a beautiful way to just, you know, learn the business. And was it interesting for you to go and spend time in the southern part of America? It was. It was different then. Um, Yeah. You know, let's face it. um, You know, a girl with an Italian last name and a Brooklyn accent going to Atlanta, Georgia. You know, they looked at me a few times, but I got a lot of nice friends. I made a lot of nice friends in Atlanta and uh, learned a lot there. Um, Boy, you sure did because your career then it just like skyrockets after. Well, you know what, Dana? It seems like that, but it really didn't. I know, I know, I know. Yeah, you know, people look at me and they're like, "Wow, your transition from the White House was so smooth." I'm like, "Really? You have no idea what it felt like inside, but it might look like that." And and how many nights did you cry because you didn't get the assignment that Mm -hmm. you wanted? You were passed over for a job, and and that you know happened plenty of times in my life. When I came back, I worked for Regis Philbin. And at the time, uh, it was Cindy Garvey. It was a local uh, New York show. And I was Regis's PA, basically, and doing once a week um, an on-air report. And it was more like kind of family things to do. And I would go downstairs to Eyewitness News news director and beg him, hey, if somebody calls out sick this weekend, call me and I'll fill in and I'll, you know, I'll report the news. And it became very, very regular. And uh, eventually, um, it was full time. And I was very excited because that was my dream, to work at the same place where Roseanne Scamadella did. And um, and one of the other people who was my mentors was Ernie Anastas. Roseanne oh, wow. introduced me to Ernie Anastas, mm-hmm. who many decades later became my TV partner at Fox 5 in New York. That's amazing. It, you know, it's, it's funny um, when you leave uh, Fox News headquarters and you get into a, a car to go somewhere, like a taxi or Uber, um, they'll say, oh, where do you work? Oh, Fox. Like, oh, Fox 5. <laughs> they love you. They love Aww. Fox 5. They, and so, so for people listening, so Fox News Channel is one part of the company. And then the Fox affiliates, like what you watch on your home channel, like your local station, Rosanna is the head of that for New York in the mornings. And it, you are an institution in New York. I can't believe how long I honestly it's don't been. can't believe I get to know you. Because uh, please, Dana, you, you are... You really, I know that maybe you might think that about me because of White House days, whatever, et cetera. Yes, but of course. You've had a stellar career and continue to kill it every day. But it's great to, it's great to meet, a, 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 have a new friend as you get older in life. Like, it's nice to meet a new friend and somebody you. that you admire and can learn from. Well, I, I learn a lot from you, too. Um, and I have to say, you are an inspiration. You do such <laughs> great work. You're so... Um, I don't know, in tune with what's happening. I don't know. I mean, that takes a lot of work, but you seem to have your finger on the pulse of a lot of stuff. So I I do want to ask you about what, what do you think is some of the best advice you ever got as you worked your way up? Like, what do you, what do you pass on to younger people now? I've gotten some advice like be you. Okay. I, I, in the beginning, being me was something I wasn't sure I was, you know, I was trying to work on my Brooklyn accent and I felt like when I got rid of the Brooklyn accent, not that I ever did, but cleaned it up a little bit, I couldn't be me. Mm -hmm. You know, part of, I feel like my sense of humor is my Brooklyn thing, you know? (laughs) Um, So being me was part of it. The other part that I really think is important is really getting to know the people who you talk to every day. And I find like, a lot of the young people that that get into this business, they just want to do their job and go home. It's not enough. 
you got to you got to touch the people in your neighborhood. You got to get involved. You got to learn who they are. You got to find out what makes them tick, what makes them angry, what they need. And, um, you know, I am still very involved in various neighborhoods because I, I, I you know, Things change. Like, so give me some examples of that. Okay. For example, um, I work with the uh, organization HeartShare, and uh, they're based in Brooklyn. They uh, are a wonderful organization that help foster children and those who have developmental problems. And uh, I talk to their families. I understand their journeys and what makes them tick, what they need, how the government is not doing enough for them. And it gets me back in the neighborhood, walking around with those families. It's not easy for a lot of families right now, um, you know, not making enough money and certainly um, worried about how they're raising their children. I have two kids. My kids are adults. And I'm constantly <laughs> needing uh, support. Uh, it's not like years ago. Is that your competitive advantage? Do you think, I always like to talk about that. Like For me, I always say, especially in the White House years, that I, I, I felt an inferiority complex education-wise because most people that I was working with had gone to the Ivy League schools, and I obviously did not. But I would try to be the most well-read person in the room. And I still like to be, to try to be that way. And for you, maybe that is part of your appeal and your success is that you know who you're talking to. You know, it's so funny. Um, okay, I didn't go to Ivy League school either. Uh, Catholic University, very proud of my Catholic education. Um, I feel like I'm street smart. Yeah. And I can smell BS when it walks in the door. And so when we have, um, you know, politicians and celebrities on Good Day New York, you know, mm. I am constantly, you know, calling them out. I live here. I work here. I've raised my children here. My family has a business here. You know, we have a restaurant, Fresco by Scotto. I know what it takes to stay alive in New York City. And so when these politicians come in and I feel like they're bought and paid for, I'm calling them out. Are you sad about the state of New York City or do you have an optimistic viewpoint? I'm staying hopeful. Okay. I'm staying hopeful because I feel like Mayor Adams um, really wants to clean up New York City. The problem is Albany um, is dragging its feet, and I don't know why they are. I am trying to figure out, you know, they live in our neighborhood. The, the Speaker of, of the, the, the Assembly lives in our, our, our area. Like, they can't be oblivious Carl Hasty had a shooting outside of his office. He's a, the assembly's a, a majority leader. He had a shooting outside his office, and he refused to cooperate with the police. Wow. Why? Mm -hmm. You don't want to admit that there's crime in your neighborhood? Right. What has the impact of the migrant surge been in the city from your point of view? Um, I do see a lot of people on the street with signs saying they're from Venezuela. I don't know if it's true or not, but they're saying they're from Venezuela, they need work or they need, you know, food. Um, I, you know, if you go by any of those hotels mm -hmm. that have been transformed into, um, you know, temporary housing, uh, you'll see a lot of the men on the street. Uh, I think some of them are working as delivery people, lots of bicycles out there. Lots. Lots. And, um, you know, we've had reporters go over there with the waste of food that's being thrown out mm. because they don't like our food. Um, and you hear about reports of fights there, too much Isn't drinking. Isn't it interesting that Mayor Adams, he has been somewhat critical of Biden, but mostly asking for help. But to your point about Albany, why won't they back him and asking for that help? Isn't that weird? <laughs> Beats me. Yeah, me too. Beats me. And like I said, the two most powerful people in Albany are from our area. Mm -hmm. So it's not like they're from Buffalo and Rochester. They're, they're from our area, yeah. and they know. What about also, I'm curious, this is not just something that happened in New York City, but all across the country, um, the education system, public schools, for as much as you could try to get some charter schools going or get people to be able to uh, a voucher to get to go to Catholic school if their parents choose to, but overall, we have a really dire situation um, in not just New York, but Philly, Baltimore, Chicago, Los Angeles, San Francisco. I mean, I could go on. And 
I, I like to try to zero down to what is the most important problem we could try to solve? Like, we can solve problems. I think we need to have election reform. Okay. I think right now, a lot of these politicians are constantly fundraising mm, for their true. next election. And a lot of them um, get donations from the United Federation of Teachers. And I, I don't care what you say. <laughs> That has to have some kind of influence on how you approach your politics. And in New York City, every year, thousands and thousands and thousands of kids graduate from our high schools and can't read and write. That should be a crime. Okay. And yeah. yet we will not expand charter schools, which have done a terrific job in New York's black and brown communities, uh, getting them up to speed getting them off to college and being prepared for college. You're hearing from CUNY and SUNY schools saying that the kids graduating, most of the kids graduating from New York City schools have to go to remedial school. I know. They have to take basic English So classes. why is that allowed to happen well, year after year after year? And then you have people calling for free college. I'm like, uh, not until K through 12 is fixed. Thank you very much. That's how I feel. I mean, I don't understand it. You know, at one point, the mayor was talking about trying to get the cap lifted for charter schools in New York. I mean, it is a public school. Granted, most of them are not taught by union teachers, and I think that's the problem. We'll be right back with more of this interview after this. You've covered some pretty significant trials. What do you make of the just fascination of the true crime storylines, the true crime podcast of which we just launched a new one uh, that Emily Campagno is um, leading, true crime documentaries. I don't know, but I love them all. You do? I Are you do. into it? My husband's always saying, why do you listen to and, and watch all this stuff? He said, it's always the husband, you know, kills the wife, the <laughs> wife kills the husband. I said, well, you know, jokingly around, I'm just trying to get my, uh, my story in order in case <laughs> it comes down to that. No, I just think because there's an ending to it. You know, we know that the person gets caught. I mean, I don't know what's the fascination living somebody else's life um, and and that there is some kind of resolution. They get caught. Mm -hmm. I don't know. But I love them all. What was one of your most memorable crime covering experiences? Well, I've done a few of them. Uh, one of them was the Preppy uh, murder trial, which was uh, this very handsome young boy um, was convicted of strangling a young, beautiful woman in Central Park. Mm -hmm. um, we covered that trial day in, day out. Uh, I, I'd gotten to know her family a lot and, um, you know, really got their side out because, let's face it, the young boy was, it seemed like he came from a privileged background, very, very handsome, um, and the victim kind of was maligned a little bit during the process. Oh, really? Okay. So we were there to make sure that she wasn't maligned and that her family had a voice for her. Mm. Uh, that was one of them. The other one was uh, the Woody Allen Mia Farrow custody battle. So when that took place, we somehow got our hands on the tape that Mia Farrow's daughter uh, Dylan had made mm. where she talked about what Woody, her dad, did to her in the house. Mm -hmm. We were the only TV station who had it. And we never put it on the air, obviously, because it was a young child right. who basically was accusing their father of rape. Uh, never went anywhere. Uh, but we did not put it on the air. But we talked about it. And we eventually uh, had an interview with Mia Farrow. And we talked to a lot of her friends from the singer Carly Simon to Rose Styron. Wow. I mean, just we we covered that story mm -hmm. day in, day out for well over a year. And we really got the essence of what it was and learned a lot about Woody Allen in, in the meantime. You know, learned about some of the backstories of some of his movies like Manhattan and Margot Hemingway or Marielle Hemingway and what was really going on on the movie set. Uh, we got a lot of um, blowback from his uh, PR team at that time. How do you 
I don't want to say decompress because I don't think you decompress. I see you at <laughs> night. You're at Fresco by Scotta, which is a fantastic restaurant in New York. I highly recommend it. The food's amazing. The atmosphere is terrific. The service can't be beat. And there's dancing, which is so fun. <laughs> um, but I've been sort of dealing with this a little bit lately, too. Like sometimes the news can just get on top of you mm. because we are reporting the news. We want to make sure everybody gets the news. And, and a lot of it is mm. negative, bad news. Right? Sometimes it's really bad. And there have been days I've been going home going, wow, we have so many problems. There's so many problems to solve. Do you have a way of you know, releasing some of that? Yeah. So um, I learned a few years ago uh, Transcendental Meditation uh, through Bob Roth uh, at the David Lynch Center. And it really does help because I feel sometimes, you know, that I have like post-traumatic stress from reporting the news, living our lives walking the streets of New York City, um, you really need to go home and just take care of yourself. Mm -hmm. And I, 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 I do guess, like a guided meditation. I like those. Transcendental, I think for me, I'm like, I'm a little, maybe a little bit too distracted. I know you can, yes, I you like can the get guided distracted. meditation ones because I feel like I can pay attention better. I think anytime that you do any kind of meditation, whether it's guided mm -hmm. or transcendental, um, it's helpful. And it really ha and you helps have a, your mind. You have strong family bonds. And it's interesting because I always tell people, don't be afraid to move. Your career may take you in a lot of different places. Go, go, go. And there's been part of me lately that's like, you know what? There's something to be said about being nearer to your family. Mm -hmm. You know, I love New York City. Mm -hmm. I, I want New York City to win. And my family's here. Everybody's here. My My mom is here. My two children are Your here. Your mom's a kick. I, I know. <laughs> she really is. You have no idea, Dana. <laughs> um, and uh, our family restaurants here, yeah. which is an extension of our home, Fresco by Scotto. And um, I, I just, I, you know, I, I lived in Atlanta. And could I see myself going back to the South again, Atlanta or Florida? We were just in Florida. A lot of our customers and friends were there. And I was like, wow, maybe we should move down here for a few months. But I think I would miss the excitement and the scrappiness, the grittiness. I love this city. You know, I love it here. I really do. It's grown on me. Um, I'm, I, and I, I root for it as well. Um, well, let me ask you this. Uh, this is the question everybody asks. Your work-life balance. Mm. Have you ever figured it out? No. Me neither. <laughs> <laughs> and this is like 30-something years into it. Yeah, they're just you just... Keep going. You know, it's so funny. Every year uh, in January, I make a resolution like, I'm going to stop and smell the coffee. <laughs> I'm going to learn how to say no. And and every year, like I'm running around like every day, like a crazy person. Um, but I also think it has to do with our zest for life. Yeah. And it's not a, a, a thing about FOMO, fear of missing out. It's like... Oh my goodness, we have this wonderful opportunity. Why would I say no? So to I was it? thinking about you because you get up at what, four in the morning? Yeah. Okay, four. And then I'm a little bit later. I'm like a four thirty, four forty five. Um, because we have the morning shows. Yours is earlier than mine. You gotta be you you're hitting the ground running very early. Um, but we get up and prep. Um there was something that was said the other day that you should pray before you take on any additional commitment. Oh, I like that. And really let yourself marinate in it for a little bit and really like let God help you decide. Huh. But then remember last year when you were the uh, MC of the Al Smith dinner? Al Smith dinner. Yes, I was so nervous about that, Dana. Well, that's and it's a huge honor right. being the MC of the Al Smith dinner is a big <laughs> deal and that's a high stakes for, and it's a big event. It was the first one post COVID. And there you are in the evening taking care of everybody. And I'm thinking it is almost 1030 and she's got to get up at four in the morning. Right. And it's so funny because people said to me, why don't you, why didn't you take the day after no, off? Because I would never do that. And, and also I need to talk about it. Right. You have to, you have to show, I always feel that if you're going to do something at night or if, or if the team is doing something together at night, like election night, there's no way I would take the next morning no off because everybody else has to work too. That's right. Um, we'll make it up at some point, like the rest <laughs> and relaxation. As I say, there's eternal rest at some point. Yes. At this point, I am just enjoying the wonderful opportunities that come my way. What's the best thing that you and your husband have done together to try to um, stay 
connected as everything has grown for you career wise and with the restaurant. And I don't even, I don't actually know what your husband does. I've never had a pleasure so to meet him. My husband is an attorney. Okay. He's a real estate attorney, uh, Louis Ruggiero. And, um, you know what? I have to say it boils down to simple things. Sundays we cook together and uh, our family comes together and we have... Do you have mandatory Sunday night dinner? We, I love that yes, idea. Yes. I love that. It's actually afternoon. Okay. What time? It's like one thirty-two. And what time do you eat? Um, 2.30. We're, you know, wow. we, we love then, to eat. And then wow. it goes on for a few hours. I love that. Do you do that? No. <laughs> no, I don't do that at all. I, but I, I actually... That is something that I've never really saw any family do um, in Wyoming or Denver. I mean, fam especially family in Wyoming because they ranch together as well. They're, they're together a lot all the time. And so it's just natural. It's not like a mandatory Sunday dinner. But when I moved out, out east, especially up here to New York, when I learned that that was, that was like a thing, like I love that tradition. Oh, you're going to have to come over for family dinner. Oh, okay. Um, just bring stretch pants okay. because uh, <laughs> it is marathon eating. But um, it's just, it goes back to my family. Uh, they started that uh, and I'm sure their parents did yeah. it for It's a for great them. tradition. But I have to tell you, it gets harder and harder just because we don't have the typical work hours anymore. No. You know, people work Saturdays and Sundays. And so getting that family unit together is a real challenge, but we're up for it. You know, we try yeah. to do it the best we Everyone possibly can. Everyone does their can. best to get there. Yes. Gosh, that's really great. More to come right after this. I have a, a round of short questions with Dana Perino. Are you ready? I'm ready. Okay. What is your favorite meal to cook? Pasta with broccoli. Just with broccoli? Yeah, I love to saute the broccoli uh, with a little garlic and oil and hot chili peppers. And it's, you know, just... Wow, that sounds good. It's so good. And sometimes I throw in sausage. My son likes the sausage. I love a it. sausage. What okay. is? Yeah, I was going to ask you that. What is the your favorite meal? Like, what would your kids say? Is their favorite meal? They like that. That's they what like, that's yeah, they favorite. like that. They like broccoli. You got kids that, to eat broccoli. Because um, I've always been uh, a vegetable person, and so it was introduced very early. Smart. Gosh. Okay. What is worth splurging on? A vacation. I love a good vacation. I love to go somewhere and feel like I have more money than I really do <laughs> and <laughs> see the sun. Oh, and, give me an example. Where have you been that you would recommend? Um Anguilla. Okay. It is so beautiful. It's two planes to get to, so it's a little bit of a journey. But when you get there, um, the most magnificent sunrises and sunsets, uh -oh. and the water is crystal blue, and just about guaranteed weather every day. Okay, wait, I've never been, so that's a great... Oh, you must wait, go. somebody I know goes there. It might be Shannon Bream. It's so it pretty. Might be Shannon Bream. It's so pretty. It's, it's like the calmer version of St. Bart's. Okay. Okay. I've never been to St. Bart's either. Uh, that I need you, to go. That you need to bring. I had a very, I had a negative experience in the Bahamas and then another one in Jamaica. And I've just never really been back to any of the oh, islands. Oh, I'm I gotta sorry. I got to fix that. You got to fix Anguilla. it okay. immediately. Oh, actually Antigua. I've been there several times. Gorgeous over there as well. Actually only one time. Yeah. But I was invited to go twice that I haven't been able to go. <laughs> um, but my friend who's listening knows I will be there one of these days. Um, what song instantly puts you in a good mood? Native New Yorker by Odyssey. Oh. You grew up right in the subway. <laughs> I'm not going to sing for you, Dana. I don't know that song. You don't? It's, it's an oldie song, uh, but it celebrates Native New Yorkers. What is something people would be surprised to learn about you? That I like to stay home. Um, <laughs> I do too. <laughs> you know, when I get sometimes when I... I, I'll get in my pajamas at five, six o'clock at night. It is such a treat. There's no transition clothing for me, right? So I'm wearing a dress and boots now. And when I get home at 630, I don't put on like a different outfit and then a different outfit for sleeping. Like, no, it's like straight to the pajamas. pajamas. Situation. Me too. <laughs> me too. Because yeah, we have that. to go to bed so early. What time do you go to bed? Um, if I'm home early, um, I get in bed about 830, lights out 930. Yeah, me too. That's about there right. You go. That's about right. We can have a sleepover. <laughs> Everybody's going to be like, wow, they do not want our jobs at <laughs> all. Okay. Um, what's your favorite thing about the work you do? Helping people. You get the feedback, right? I get the feedback immediately. It's a wonderful position of power if you use it appropriately. Yeah. I love cutting through the red tape and helping somebody. Yeah. There's this young, I actually didn't think I helped her that much, but down in um, Point Pleasant uh, Beach, New Jersey, 
there was this young woman. She wanted to open up a little shop, and it, it was going to require two sinks. And the, it took eight and a half months for that town to approve her permits. And I was losing my mind on her behalf to the point that I said something to the mayor, not on camera, not on air, like right. I'm not going to put that on Fox News, uh, obviously. But I said, you should help her. You, this is outrageous. And I feel for people who are entrepreneurial that are trying to do the right thing and they're getting stymied by government. That I drives know. me nuts. I know. Sometimes they're not that easy on people who want to just make a and living. And it's also amazing like if you point out a charity that has a good track record that you want to promote, that you want to highlight because they've done something great. Our viewers at Fox News Channel, and I'm sure at Local Fox 5, are very generous yes. because they trust your judgment. You know, we were involved with helping to save this cheese shop that is the last cheese shop in Little Italy. And um, that area has really gentrified. It used to yes. be a lot of Italian-Americans, but now it's a beautiful melting pot, but it was the last, like, Italian-American hold on that area and they were having problems with their landlord we brought it up two or three times on good day and the woman called me and she said oh my goodness i have so many people coming in who want to help save the shop so good for you yeah. i love that story what book has had a profound impact on you oh there's so many good books but recently i've started revisiting the secret oh yeah because uh, there's so many studies recently that say the people who have an optimistic outlook and are hopeful will do better in life. And I thought like the secret, that was the genesis of yeah. it, basically. Mm -hmm. That's good. Yeah. I love that. When you were a kid, what did you want to be when you grew up? You said actress. I did. And did you want Broadway actress or movies? I wanted uh, movies. Okay. Movies, but, you know, like I said. Do you like to go to Broadway? I love Broadway. Yeah, what's your favorite show right now? Um, I went to see uh, the Neil Diamond musical, and uh, the person, Will Swenson, who uh, plays Neil Diamond, just gets the essence of him and is just so charismatic. Excellent. And the music is beautiful. Uh, is there a place you want to see before you die? Dubai. Really? Yes. Why? I, because I hear it's like a, a fantasy land. I want to go to a fantasy land. I want to be. Well, you can do that. This is going to be easy. You that's think, an easy one. You think so? Yes. You just get on play. Yes. It Everyone seems goes so to Dubai. far. <laughs> it's not that far. Have you been to Israel? I have. I love so, Israel. So there you go. It's, yeah. it's the same. Oh, it's the same amount of yeah, hours? Yeah, amount, amount of time. Yeah. yeah. I love Israel. I mean, it's, it's, it, it, Dubai, I'm not, gonna, I, I'm not knocking it, but when... I guess having been there, I don't feel like I need to go there again. Right, because you've been there already. Yeah. Where do you want to go? <laughs> Where do I want to go? I, I have, okay, I have this great opportunity when I worked for President Bush to do something I never thought I would get to do, which is to really travel the world. And in that last year, just in that last year, we went to 43 countries. Wow. 43 or 44 countries in oh one year. Oh, my goodness. Because Were you exhausted? Well, yeah, all the time, of course. Yeah. Um, and also my husband is British and he has traveled internationally for business for his career. So I've gotten to go to a few places with him, including Abu Dhabi and, and Dubai. Um, I, I do enjoy going to Africa, but um, I love Spain. I love Spain I love too. all of Europe. I actually really love all of Europe, but I've decided to kind of zero in and understand and learn one of the countries. And I've chosen Spain as that country. So I've been to several different places. There's a lot more to explore and mm. to do. And I followed this young woman on Instagram. Her name is Morgan in Spain. And she's American who married a Spanish guy after college. And she's living there now. And she's adorable. I, she helps you understand what it's like to live abroad. Um, and I'm kind of maybe living vicariously through her because I did live in England for a year with my husband. But I was so ready to come back to America. I, I love it here. And I've had a great opportunity to travel a lot of places in America. The national parks are such a treasure of mm. ours and i would like to, to dig in deeper a little bit there they're so popular right now i want to go and do that too have you done that in the southwest like to bryce canyon i and know zion I to, canyon i need to do that i that's, need to do that, that let's put that on your list uh, so that's dubai going... and zion canyon okay maybe i'll i'll flip them let me just end by asking you if you were to give a young person not even wanting to go into this business um advice right now if when things feel a little turbulent maybe for them or maybe they feel stymied because they they're in a hurry you know they're in a hurry to mm -hmm. succeed what, what three pieces of advice would you give them don't be afraid to change 
and make a move. Be dedicated. Uh, sometimes well, our business, for sure, uh, requires a certain degree of unexplained insanity to work in it. But if you love it, you have to be very dedicated. And the third piece of advice I'm going to say, go to the office. A lot of people, I love it. You're right. A lot of people are still loving to sit on their couch. I'm sorry. There's something about communicating with people in the office. You will learn. You will grow being around people. You know what I love the most about this is you communicated your zest for life so beautifully. And I thank you for being on the podcast. Thank you, Dana. Love you so much. Love you. Mutual admiration society. Same. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. I could talk to Rosanna every day. I'm telling you, when you get into a taxi in New York and they think you work at Fox, they'll think local Fox 5. And they want to know if you know Rosanna. Make sure you go to Fresco by Scotto, this amazing restaurant in New York City if you're visiting. They have an amazing opportunity for you to enjoy food and also dance a little bit if you want to at dinner. Make sure you subscribe to this series wherever you download podcasts, leave a rating and review. I'm Dana Perino. Everything will be okay. Listen ad-free with a Fox News Podcast Plus subscription on Apple Podcasts, and Amazon Prime members can listen to this show ad-free on the Amazon Music app.